All right, an old friend of ours is back. Have you heard about this? Have you read about this? Well, considering we were just talking about WWE, I think I know exactly <laughs> who you're talking about. Yes. The incomparable John Laurinaitis is back in charge of talent relations. Uh, I think the next WWF president is going to be Willie Gilsenberg. Um, <laughs> I knew that would pop you. As a matter of fact, I popped Vince with that one time back in when Jack Tunney was still the WWF president. We were watching a pre-tape one time at the monitor. I said, boy, he's no Willie Gilsenberg. And fucking Vince popped because I'm probably the only person that mentioned that name to him in 15 years. And I wrote a magazine article one time for the WWF magazine and I, I made my byline Joseph T. Mont. Just to see if anyway, <laughs> nevertheless, I know I'm popping you, but nobody else knows what the fuck's going on. Anyway, John Laurinaitis is brought back as the head of talent relations. He's the one that took over. For Jim Ross, when Jr. said, fuck, I've got to get the fuck out of Connecticut and back to Oklahoma back in, I believe, 2004. And that's when all of the shit started with uh, me and OVW and John Laurinaitis and et cetera. But he's been, I guess he's been back as an agent and we just haven't noticed or cared. But, and, and I, I don't hate John Laurinaitis. As a matter of fact, he did me a favor. Uh, and I told him, I saw him at the Hall of Fame thing back, what, three, four years ago now. And we had a polite, brief conversation and smiled at each other because I I think I even told him, I said, you saved me have, probably having a fatal heart attack by running me off from OVW when you did. Um, So I'm, I'm not mad at him and I don't hate him, but I'm just astonished. It, it, they keep hiring... Is not the definition of insanity, or is this the modern definition of insanity? Hiring the same people to do the same things and expecting a different result. Is that now the definition of wrestling insanity? I mean, I guess, but you say, I mean, it's Vince. Vince is hiring people who won't question him, will just do what he says. That's why Bruce Prichard is there. And that's why Johnny Ace is there. And, you know, Johnny Ace had this role, lost it. And they kept him around as an agent for years, and now all of a sudden he's put back in this role that he was horrible in. Well, he was gone as an agent for a few years. Was he? He wasn't there at all. No, that's that's when he married the the Bella twins' his mother. That's right. He's the <laughs> father-in-law of Daniel Bryan now. Yes. Yeah. It's, I'm, this could be bigger than the Welch Fuller family before they're done. Um. But anyway, before everybody goes, well, why are they slagging off John Laurinaitis? Well, he was a successful veteran, great wrestler, wrestling mind, whatever. I just wanted to briefly go over John Laurinaitis's career in wrestling and credentials to head talent relations in the largest company in the world. And real briefly, everybody remembers the dynamic dudes, say no more. And at that point, after that, basically, John got a job in Japan with All Japan, with Giant Baba, because his brother, Animal, was, the Road Warriors were fucking huge in, in Japan and for Baba, and the brother got a job, and he's, you know your. 1990s All Japan better than I do, but he's famous for being in a lot of great six-man tags with the best Japanese wrestling talent in the world at that time. Uh, he's famous for two things. Like you said, there are good matches, surprisingly. I mean, he is one of those guys that it's hard to find good moments of him in the ring, but he is a part of really good matches where... You know, he's better than Dan Spivey, who was a regular well, there, too, at that same time yeah. and was great on the apron, but then he would get in a ring. Johnny Ace was actually a part of some classic matches, but the other thing he's famously known for was being a favorite of Mrs. Baba. Well, that's where I was going with that. <laughs> because Mrs. Baba, the tiger lady, uh, who ran the business and was the bad cop to Baba's good cop, liked the blonde guy Jean with the nice smile and the dimples. And I don't know, once again, you know your 90s Japanese history better than I do, 
Uh, but what happened to lead to him coming back? Was it was there any falling out or, or with Japan, or was it just that he finally he got a job in '99, I guess, with WCW? Yeah, I don't think it was any falling out. Um, okay, I well, could he, be wrong. He, I'm, he usually doesn't burn any bridges. I could be wrong because I'm trying to think you know, without notes in front of me. But it was around the time Baba died, too, and things started to change. Well, that's true. And he came to work for WCW behind the scenes, get out of the ring, which everyone celebrated. Yes, it was a, a goal of almost everyone was to get Johnny out of the ring. But he, from what I understand, he sold the folks at WCW on giving him a job as an agent based on the fact that, well, he's been in Japan for all these years and knows these intricate Japanese finishes and et cetera. And the thing about John is he, he doesn't look, he doesn't look like road warrior animal. He looks like a fucking accountant. He looks like a normal guy, even though he's big and tall, he looks like a normal person. He doesn't mind wearing suits. He likes to smile and go to corporate meetings. He likes to take instructions and and do the things he is supposed to do and he thrives in an environment like that and as long as he doesn't have to go out on a limb and get any heat on himself he sub subsists fine so he went from that job and, and then they bought wcw and that's how he was integrated into the wwf system and the son of a bitch within a few years because, and you remember the quote from Stephanie McMahon, within a few years, JR's wanting to get out of there. They're wanting to find somebody else to take it over. They they put Laurinaitis in the spot as JR's assistant to be the inheritor of the thing because Stephanie liked him. Because Stephanie's comment at the time when finally JR did step down and Laurinaitis took over was, we finally have a vice president of talent relations that's going to fight for the creative team instead of against it because JR was still because of his seniority and because of the fact that he just, that was his job was still telling Vince, Hey, these fucking new writers you're fucking writing or you're hiring. Don't really know a lot of cases what they're doing in the nice way that JR says these things. And so then Laurinaitis led the talent relations department in the same direction that the new writers were taking the creative farther away from wrestling and more in terms of their corporate environment. And he was happy to do it because when you think about it, and this is not even his fault, he was never a money drawing wrestler. He was never a, an influential booker. He was never, he was a high level executive, but because the people who owned or ran the companies thought he was cute and looked good in a suit. And I mean, just a few of the high points, for example, are he's the only major wrestling executive in the world. As a matter of fact, I think he's probably the only wrestling person in the world period that ever signed a contract with the wrong one-legged wrestler <laughs> that is still amazing and that is one of the most amazing stories <laughs> amongst wrestling executives in history there's two of them in the world you got a 50 50 chance of getting the right one even by accident much less just asking what his fucking name was but anyway i digress He's also, you remember the lingerie catalog, right? That was what I was going to say. He was, hey, I guess you would say the one-legged wrestler. He's most famous for that. But the second thing would absolutely be, I think that's how he found the Bellas. His daughter-in-law, <laughs> he found them, or stepdaughters, I guess. He found them in a lingerie catalog, didn't he? I, I do not know about the Bellas, but I do know that he legitimately found two develop female developmental talents that they signed to brief contracts while searching through a lingerie catalog and got in touch with their agent because that was the kind of presentation he wanted from the women and they sent him to ovw and the girl i've told this story before one girl first day just running a rope she got dizzy and passed out 
Anyway, and and <laughs> then when he took over talent relations, that was when the problems became uh got started with with me and 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 on behalf of OVW and the WWE. Jim Ross, I had contracted with, made a handshake deal with, signed contracts. The whole concept was that mine and Danny Davis's company in Louisville, Kentucky would provide training and developmental services for their company in Stamford, Connecticut. A wide variety of them. And JR insisted that the guys that they sent here follow our rules on the theory that if they can't follow our rules, they can't follow theirs either. And we worked together as territory to territory. When Laurinaitis took over, and upon reflection, I realized he was just doing stooge work. He was doing what he was told to do by people more important than him. Um, it, it, OVW turned into their storage closet. And I've told the stories. We'd get the phone call at 5.30 on Wednesday. Put so-and-so on TV tonight in an hour and a half. Fuck you. Or they shave my fucking top heel's head because they want to see what he'd look like bald and he walks in looking like a truck driver. That's where thank you, fuck you, bye came from. The voicemail I left on fucking Johnny's answering machine. Um, but he was doing that at the behest of they they wanted to do their own thing in Florida for a long time. They couldn't fuck with our track record of talent and the level of talent we were producing, but they wanted to take over and or make sure that we failed so that they could open their own deal in Florida. And that's where I said, I think Johnny saved me. because Danny Davis used to sit there on Wednesdays in his office with me when we're trying to start the TV and go, are they fucking with you on purpose? And the answer was yes. They When they ran me off, because they couldn't get a lot of shit done, they wanted to get done with me there, so they had to run me off, because I wouldn't fucking go for it. And then when I was gone and the other revenue streams started dropping because of the people that they installed as bookers to replace me and OVW's outside business went down. They threw more money at Danny Davis uh, because he was going to fucking revolt and close the whole goddamn thing down. But they threw more money at him as they stopped gap measures so that they could fuck him in what uh, very early 2007 and move the whole thing to Florida. And they weren't ready yet. And the reason I say he's, he saved my life. I would have had a heart attack by that point, but also if I'd have still been there when they actually fucked us out of a developmental deal after signing a new contract six months previously, I'd have gone to prison. I would have physically assaulted somebody by that point. Uh, but anyway, this is the guy now that's supposed to run talent relations. The only thing that he has ever done in wrestling is run their talent relations because the boss's daughter thought he looked good in a suit. He's never been a wrestler. Great wrestler, rather. He's never been a great promo. He's never been a great booker. They always said he was a great finish guy because, well, I guess if he wrote down a bunch of Japanese finishes, he'd know a bunch of good finishes. But come up with his own, I'm... Ah. He looks good in a suit, and he smiles and says yes a lot. I bet you he and Bruce Pritchard are going to be trading each other colorful sweaters this Christmas. You know, this is really, I don't know, Johnny Ace, personally, so obviously I don't have the venom that you have for <laughs> this guy that... That wasn't even venomous. That no, was but... It's disdainful. But, you know, and obviously this all started when, you know, him and Stan just had that fight over that girl. That <laughs> woman, yeah, to come to find out... <laughs> You know what? Lauren Bobert may be Johnny Ace's. <laughs> it wouldn't that, be that would make sense. Events. <laughs> A right wing <laughs> lunatic nutcase. That would make sense. John Laurinaitis. It was all his fault. But you know, looking at this, and obviously no one I mean, no one. I can't think of anyone who has faith in Johnny Ace doing a good job here. He really fucked up developmental. He didn't really hire lots of great additions to the roster. When you think of great guys in, in that department, you think of Jim Ross, and then you go to Paul Levesque. I mean, Paul Levesque had it easy. Paul Levesque basically, hey, people were buzzing about this indie guy. Let's sign him. I mean, that was really it. Very different than from what Johnny Ace did. So this all goes to, what's up with Vince? Does Vince just want 
complete bootlickers around right now? Was he always like that? And also the other question is, what does this say about what Vince thinks about the current talent he's being given out of NXT? You know, Keith Lee's off TV right now. I thought he was hurt. I don't know if he's hurt now. He's off TV. Uh, Alistair Black. Apparently the word is that Vince doesn't like him, so he's just not being used at all. Andrade not being used at all, just off TV, not being used. These are all guys coming from Paul Levesque's developmental program. Do you think there's anything to read there about hiring Johnny Ace and what Vince thinks about the talent he's being given and what Johnny Ace, what Vince thinks Johnny Ace will be able to do? And Johnny Ace is like, Bruce, you know, it's going to be just what would Vince want? I got to do exactly what Vince wants. No push Well, that's, that's it. You, you asked a question a minute ago. Is Vince want bootlickers around him? He actually... In the old days, 80s, 90s, he really didn't, but it usually ended up that way. And the reason for it is because besides the fact that that Vince is a powerful personality, I have had telephone, com- not even, even in person, but just telephone conversations with him where he changed my mind. So imagine that. He is a powerful personality to be around. He was then. I don't know about now. I'm not experiencing it daily. But he was a powerful personality to be around, and he he wanted other experienced people and wrestling people, but then he wanted to to make them be bigger than wrestling. So he he and and you know he had tons of respect for Pat Patterson, who was as wrestling business as as you could be. Um, and Pat was one of the only ones that could get away with not only being, you know, rough around the edges and, and, and not just, not just saying yes all the time, but, but, you know, bowing up at Vince in a positive way about shit and Jr. would do it. Uh, Bruce would kind of ask the weak little Weasley devil's advocate questions and then accept, uh, with little, uh, pushback, the, explanation um but at least there were people around that could say shit to him but i think now not only it's been so long none of these people that start interacting with vince now in the office they don't come from a wrestling background so they they they're more polite to begin with and they don't know how to fucking take things and also there's levels of people in between vince and the average employees whether it be wrestlers or office people now that there wasn't then i I would assume it's a lot more difficult to speak to vince now than it was 20 25 years ago so it's ended up that yeah just everybody that's around him and and plus there's a it there wasn't the desperation then there is now because now for a lot of guys you know unless you're friends with the young bucks you know, they want to make the big money in the WWF or the the employees, the creative people, the agents, whatever. They want to make the big money with the stable company that they know is going to be around, whatever. So they're afraid to rock the boat. So I, th- I think it's it's been a self-fulfilling prophecy that before he didn't want, he didn't just want bootlickers. He wanted people that he that he thought were good at what they did to challenge him. And then hopefully he would <laughs> overrule them and do what he wanted, but he'd bring them along. Right. And, but not without a fight, but now it's just, it's, it's become a thing where everybody starts out, whatever Vince wants. And so it's become that way. I don't know. Does that make any sense? It makes sense, but it says a lot about what's currently going on in WWE, all the problems. I mean, we just reviewed two things. One of them was pretty good. One of them, what was that? <laughs> and that's the best you could say about what happens on their TV show right now. It's not oh. good. Well, and you asked, what what does that say about the confidence he has in Triple H? Absolutely nothing. Because I think we mentioned before they fired Bischoff. I think we mentioned before uh, Bruce is still there. Who did they win? And Heyman. Um... Triple H ain't going to get fired. They can fire Laurinaitis again if they want to. He's in family, but not that family. Um. So, you know, Triple H can't do everything. I guess he could pop the corn, too, if he had time. But, they're, you know, he's still going to, A, he's younger. He's going to live longer. 
He'll be the one to either run the thing or benefit from the eventual sale. Um, so I, you know, I, I don't think it means he doesn't have confidence in triple H. I think it just means that he just wants the old people that he's more comfortable with. I said that when he hired Bruce, Bruce gets it. And whatever it is, is whatever Vince wants. Well, Laurinaitis has been around there long enough. He's been around Stephanie long enough. He's been around the whole company long enough to know what Vince wants. And I'm sure he's more than happy to give it to him for a large amount of money. Do you think Basil DeVito sitting by the phone? <laughs> God damn. The only one of them I wish was still around was Ed Cohen. Poor fella. He was fucking great. Um, they ran him off because he told a dirty joke in the office. Best employee they ever had. Anyway, you know, that just gives me gas. It just gives me indigestion. <laughs> it just gives me a, a bad stomach to think about all these shady people in charge of the wrestling business. I need to, you know what I need to do to settle my stomach and make my, my whole life better and make myself feel better. Brian, you know what I need to do? What's that? I need to drink some athletic green. There you go. That'll make me feel better. As, as we've mentioned, folks, it, it not only helps your health and your digestion, but it does wonders for your plumbing. My office toilet does not stop up nearly as much as it used to before I started taking the athletic greens. Folks, you know the importance of your immune system. And also, you know the importance of making sure that you get your right uh, fruits and vegetables and botanicals and vitamins and minerals and prebiotics and probiotics and digestive enzymes and no GMOs and all the other things that you need to keep yourself healthy, increase your energy and focus, fill the nutritional gaps in your diet, not to even mention the fiber. Holy mackerel, you got to have fiber because you don't want to poop out at parties. Anyway, the folks at Athletic Greens continue to obsessively improve this one formula based on the latest research. And right now, you, you, my audience, the Cult of Cornet members, can not only get an order of Athletic Greens, but a free one-year supply of vitamin D and five free travel packs of Athletic Greens with your first purchase if you visit my link today, which is athleticgreens.com slash jce we've talked about it whether it's keto free you're eating or paleo free or vegan free or dairy free gluten free whatever the case just mix this up drink it down no muss no fuss no sloppy of uh, uh, blending and mushing and juicing and all that stuff they even give you the shaker you pour this in put the water in shake it up drink it down you're healthier than ever before. Athleticgreens.com slash JCE. And you'll get a free year supply of vitamin D and five free travel packs with your order. What more can we do to keep people's vitamin D and health up to a, a maximum, Brian? I think we're doing all we can, and we just have to insist. Check out Athletic Greens. I, every morning, drink my Athletic Greens, and I don't just love the taste, which I do. But also, it makes me, gives me some peace of mind to know I start each day with all the vitamins and minerals a growing boy would need. I'd like to give you a piece of my mind, but we'll do that at a later time. But you're, <laughs> are you still a growing boy? I don't know. Maybe a shrinking boy? I don't know what to uh, say. <laughs> you might be a growing boy. Anyway, what, what are you doing, <laughs> growing boy? What the oh, hell does that mean? No, growing boy. <laughs> what are you, what are you doing on the... 605, and I know you got a special announcement, groin boy. I guess so. I thought that was Joey Ryan's gimmick, but I guess now he has found God. It could be mine. Another action-packed week on the Arcadian Vanguard Podcast Network. Get information about all shows on Twitter, at Super Podcasts, or on Facebook, at facebook.com slash Arcadian Vanguard. A few notes. The latest... Super Studcast for patrons of Ron Fuller's Studcast is up this coming week as the show comes out. A very special, this is really cool. Ron does so much to talk about Southeastern and Continental and the various promotions he worked for as a young man. And what we did was we got Ron together with George Shire, 
the wrestling historian, so Ron could learn about the AWA, because he never really worked there. He worked one time under a mask. I think he was the terrorist. And that was it. He never worked there ever when, again. When was that? I didn't even know about that. That was, it was him and Brian Nobbs as a team, and they were both under masks. Oh my God. I want to say, if it wasn't Wrestle Rock, it was one of those late era AWA <laughs> offense. He where, was, a, I, I assume he was there just in a talent, uh, as a promoter in a talent deal, and they popped him in there for a payoff. I truly don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but here, the Tennessee stud talk with George Shire all about the AWA. If you love AWA history, you got to check this out. Patreon.com slash studcast. That'll be up this coming Tuesday. Again, Patreon.com slash studcast. Want to make mention of Stick to Wrestling with John McAdam. He has just concluded a very interesting series of episodes. The 1980 Year-End Awards. Going back and reevaluating professional wrestling in 1980. Who was the best? Who was the worst? What was the best match? What was the best promotion? Really great talk. Check it out today at mcadampod.com. Also available wherever you find your favorite podcasts. Want to make a little bit of an announcement right now. I am very happy to announce that Arcadian Vanguard has recently completed a purchase of Kayfabe Memories. We've made a deal with Vince Fahey, the founder and creator of Kayfabe Memories, to bring it into the fold and really preserve this site and make sure it has a life and it keeps going. It has been such a wonderful resource for classic wrestling fans and wrestling historians. There is a fantastic site with territory breakdowns and all sorts of great content, and also an amazing message board where everything is broken down by era, by territory, and we're going to be expanding it and adding some features to it, including a forum for all Arcadian Vanguard shows and projects. If you are unaware of Kayfabe Memories, check it out. We're going to be doing a redesign, but the content is there. You can check it out now at Kayfabe. How, how, long, is, how long has it been up as a site? It's been up 20-something years now. Yeah, and a lot of the boys, a lot of the wrestlers would, would go on and post their memories and things and stuff to talk about because I've seen – I don't go there constantly because I don't have time, but I've seen it on and off over the years, and there's all kinds of fascinating stuff there. So that's the thing. For a while, people were worried that if it went away, all that information would go away. You know, Bob Roop used to post there because I was just reading this the other day. He was putting – and this is from years ago. He was putting his version of the Knoxville War, which, of course, is – you know, he was the baby face and he was trying to just do everything for the boys and, you know, rescue everything from those awful fullers. I think he got that that uh, excuse from Mansfield. You know, the one thing in there that I always find interesting and not enough people point it out, but one of his arguments is, you know, Ron wasn't paying me what he should have been. We had Southeastern on fire. You know, he was the booker. We had things on fire. But in all actuality, 1979 wasn't as hot as 78 or 77. Oh, no. So that, no, that, actually, uh, it's a big the, hole in his story right there. There was, it was notable the drop in business in 1979 in Knoxville uh, versus the previous years, which coincided with Root being the Booker and those guys getting mad and then deciding, well, don't pay me more because we're not drawing more, so I'll we'll burn the territory down. But again, there have been wrestlers on that board. I know they had issues in the past where Buddy Rose would go on there under different aliases and try to cause trouble. So it's a great history. But if you're someone who wants to learn about something from Smoky Mountain Wrestling, you can go there and there's great information. Like I said, we're going to be expanding the board to add more wrestling history. And uh, we encourage people to sign up for the board. If you want to contribute, now we're not going to put up with any riffraff. We're going to throw you right the fuck out. But if you yeah. want to contribute and you want to talk about classic wrestling, if you want to add the wrestling history, check out the message board. And again, kayfabememories.com. The board is available at tinyurl.com slash wrestling history forum or just go to kfabememories.com there'll be a link there to go to the forum but lots of exciting things we're going to be working on i'm very happy to say vince fahey once again the founder and creator of the site is going to be staying on board and helping me out with some projects he is the publisher emeritus and we got some really exciting adventures that we plan to have in the future with kfab memories so a really exciting fun thing we've been working on for a while and more Arcadian Vanguard announcements to come in the coming weeks. Adventures. And of course, speaking of adventures, the 605 Super Podcast. Oh, now you're- The Mother 
ship! Oh, god damn it. Go through the archive today at 605pod.com. The upcoming opening day Star Wars is being planned right now, and that will kick off a new season of the 605 Super Podcast with all new episodes. But get ready for that by going through the archive, 605pod.com, available wherever you find your favorite podcasts. The Mothership. I tried to fake you yeah, out. Yeah, tail that one down. I was uh, faking you out. <laughs>